Hey guys, Tammy here, and I wanted to quickly share that I'm hosting a free five-day Facebook challenge starting next Monday, July 18th. Now, this challenge is designed specifically for moms, and it's called Custody Courts and Conflict with a Narcissistic Ex. So whether you're dealing with legal issues with your narcissistic ex or just life issues with your narcissistic ex, this is definitely a training that you won't want to miss. We'll post a link so that you can easily register, but you can also go to divorceuniversityonline.com forward slash custody dash challenge to secure your spot. I'll see you soon. Hello, you are listening to the Divorce University Online Podcast with your hosts, Thomas and Tammy Ferreira. Hi, I'm Tammy. And I'm Thomas. And today is going to be all about listener questions, okay? We've had a few questions on um, the YouTube channel, particularly recently, and I'm gonna go through some of those and um, we're gonna, me, me or Thomas one, I think a lot of these will be for Thomas, but we'll let um, him answer those or I'll chime in or whatever. Now, I, I really wanna start out by just saying um, thank you to one of our listeners. We have a listener in California named Andre, and we received the sweetest um, handwritten, if you're on YouTube, uh, you can see we had, uh, if you're watching the video, we had a, a two-page uh, letter from him, handwritten, which is so unusual these days. You never get that. Usually we get emails or uh, something That's very like old that. school. Yes. It's very old school, <laughs> but it's very sweet because it takes a lot of effort and time to sit down and, and do that. And he just, you know, thanked us. He's been a listener for a while, and he um, thanked us in the letter and um, just kind of shared the how it helped him in his own case. and the impact that the uh, podcast and the videos have had. So thank you for that. We always appreciate hearing that. You know, we're kind of, um, when you're recording these podcasts and right. things, you're sort of in a black hole, right? It's not like yeah. we're having any kind of immediate feedback. Um, so to get feedback from somebody that just kind of says, wow, this really, really made an impact for me is yeah. uh, is gratifying. It's part of what keeps us doing what we're doing. We're in a negative business too. It's We are in a negative <laughs> business. So it's not like a lot of people come back and go, yeah, you help me get divorced. <laughs> it's not one of those things. Um, and so, you know, just to know that we had some kind of positive impact on a very negative process is, uh, like I said, it's it's gratifying for us. So thank you, Andre, for that. We appreciate it. So I'm going to go through, I, you know, I think we have at least like one or two questions um, that we're going to do in upcoming episodes just because they're so. Um, they're big. They're big. Yeah, they're kind of like they, they require a, there's a lot of explanation or a lot of uh, different tips that we can give. And so if we don't answer your question in this specific episode and you've left one recently, then, um, you know, just stay tuned because it, it may be coming. It may just be that your episode was kind of a. Yeah, we a, do a get a lot question. of great ideas. So. Yeah, we do get a lot of. So yeah. So we always appreciate the questions and comments and things. Yeah. So, um. Okay, so here's one question we had. Somebody said, can you talk about parental rights when a deceased parent, um, you know, their parents um, want to be involved with the child? So, so grandma and grandpa. So the spouse passed away um, and grandma and grandpa are seeking uh, rights to the children. Now, this doesn't always come in the form of um, one spouse passing away. We've also had situations where um, there was like mom and dad were both uh, drug addicted and there were issues mm -hmm. and we had a grandparent that was seeking right. rights. Um, and, and so we Well, have, those are very different situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. But I think just well, about grandparent rights in general, um, I think is is the question. So. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, we've been talking about, uh, um, you know, lately in the news, the uh, we're learning about uh, substantive due process, which is something that we talk about in law school. But this is essentially the source of a lot of the constitutional rights that have kind of been invented by the court. And the courts, uh, you know, and, and parental rights is one of them. One of the constitutional rights. Right. There's no. There's no. There's no clause in the, uh, in the Constitution anywhere that says that you have a constitutional right to 
the fellowship and and uh, camaraderie of your children, although that's often in state law. Uh, but either way, federal or state, the courts tend to to be jealous to protect the rights of parents to have the enjoyment of their children. And you're putting me on the spot, and I don't remember the name of the case, but I can put it in the, in the. I can go find it and put it in the notes. But the case essentially held that you can't just deprive a parent of their right to the fellowship and uh, what's the word that the court used? I'm trying to remember. Uh, the um, it it was something like the enjoyment of your parent-child relationship. Um, and uh, so the courts are, in general, protective. And I think that our family law courts are protective of rights of parents. And our family code says that natural parents are have priority in custody when they're deciding what to do. If there is a surviving parent, uh, that parent is going to be the person you have to suck up to. And I hate to say that because I've had several cases in which I've represented grandparents in that situation. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember one, it was this kind of smug kid. and I don't, Yeah, that's kid, the one I'm thinking of too. Yeah, you know, He would sit there and read his Bible to show everybody how pious he was. And I, I just, you know, he, this kid really ticked me off. Uh, but unfortunately, he had the right to say no to any grandparent visitation in the case. Right. And really, just under the law, I was powerless to get that ordered by the court. Right. Uh, so, you know, you fall back on our relationship skills like we've talked about and, you know, realize that if your goal is to have more time with these children, then maybe being right is not so important or right. maybe you know being the wiser person is not so important uh and you have to defer then to that parent's authority uh to get your time but the law is really not on your side if there's a surviving parent right and so this particular question came from the surviving parent Right. Because the surviving parent is having issues with the grandparents. Right. And so the answer for the surviving parent is it's up to you. Right. The, 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 the For the surviving parent, the, the law is in your favor. Right. Frankly, uh, because the court gives great deference to the parental judgment. Right. Of a, uh, a, a of a parent. And if that surviving parent feels that it's not in the child's best interest. Right. You know, we have a statute in California about, you know, where you can ask the court for uh, for grandparent visitation rights. But the bar is extremely high. You know, you have to essentially establish that you have been in a kind of a quasi parental relationship with this child before they'll even consider it. Well, in the case that you were talking about earlier that you did have, that grandparent was yeah. in a quasi parental relationship mom and the children had lived with her for several years right. and they still wouldn't right. override dad's right they deferred to the judgment of the parent that that grandparent visitation was inappropriate right so again you fall back on on the if you're the grandparent you fall back on your relationship skills right. that you know listen to the podcast a lot, a lot of good stuff right if you are the the surviving parent. Uh, I think it's important to remember that the grandparents may be this child's best connection to the to the deceased parent. Right. Uh, and uh, and there may be problems in that family. I don't know, but I think in weighing whether it's in your child's best interest to have a relationship with the grandparents, you know, grandparents have an important role in a child's life. Right. Uh, and uh, and I think it's good for them to have grandparents. But there are situations where, I don't know, maybe the grandparent is in a gang or something. Well, in yeah. this particular situation, there was concerns about drug and alcohol use was one of the issues. So. Right. 
you know, and maybe in that situation, like maybe you come up with, you know, a lot of this stuff is about being creative and maybe you come up with an alternative that's something like, well, you know, they can have some form of supervised visitation. You're right. And that supervised visitation doesn't have to be like a professional supervisor right. necessarily. It could perhaps be another family member. Right. Yes. And say, you know, the grandparents can only see the child when the aunt is present or, you know, yeah. whatever. Or it could be you if you can stand them. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you can. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you can't stand them. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me get another question up so i apologize because this is going to take me no you're supposed to say thank you for being patient <laughs> while we find the next question yes thank you for being patient while we find the next question. that's a good one by the way that, that's a good little relationship hack uh is to say instead of saying i'm sorry <laughs> you say thank you for thank you for your patience right yeah, I we had a we were out to dinner the other day, and the waitress said to a, the server, "I'm sorry." That's an antiquated term. Okay, well, I'm an old guy. I know. Yeah, so the the server said, uh, "I appreciate your patience while we clear your table." Right. And instead of their fallback is always, "I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to make you wait." Yeah. And but you know, to me, that's more dignified. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. What do you think about no, that? No, I agree. It, and that's something that uh, yeah. I learned that somewhere. I remember, you know, they say don't apologize. Like if you are running late or whatever, you say, you know, thank you for waiting instead of saying I'm sorry I'm late, you know, kind of thing. Right. Because if you say I'm sorry I'm late, like what can the other person really say anyway other than that's okay? Yeah, well. I mean, unless they're a total jerk and say, well, well you should be sorry. <laughs> you just need to take a long walk on a short pier. <laughs> But you saying, take your sorry and shove it. Uh, yeah, but saying thank you for waiting <laughs> is more, you know. Yeah. Okay, so here's the next question. So um, somebody says um, the other parent is using financial hardship as ammunition in their case, and so they're wondering the best way to present it. Uh, like the other parent is saying, oh, well, this parent doesn't have a car or – you know, uh, this is this is mom in this case. And she right. said the other thing he's saying is, oh, she has a medical condition. That makes her a bad mother. Um, you know, how can she, she has stay? bad motheritis or what? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> how can she stay child focused yeah. when he's kind of bringing in these personal attacks that have to do with her finances and her stability? Right. You know, well, if the personal attacks are directed to you, it's real simple. Don't listen. Uh, but if they if they're directed at the court, there's a possibility, uh, depending on the judicial officer, that he's going to hurt his own case by doing that. Uh, but I I think that it, when you have that situation, and and we have that on the other side too, we have dads that are living in studio apartments, right? Uh, and uh, the in the in the statutory scheme of California family law, and I think in most other states as well, uh, it's really, a, it's a best interest of the child standard. And the law is very protective of the parental relationships. So to put that in English, it's better to have a, an involved dad and have the kid sleep on the couch in his studio apartment than it is to have them not see dad. Right. I, and to, to break it down even into further English, <laughs> <laughs> maybe Southern yeah. English, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I find the courts don't really give a lot of weight to financial issues. Like if one parent lives in a multi-million dollar home and the other parent, like Thomas said, lives in a studio apartment, the court isn't going to base their custody arrangement or their parenting schedule or whatever around, oh, well, one parent has a multi-million dollar home, so the child should spend more time there. Right. It doesn't come down to that. It comes down right. to your parent-child Frequently, that's not the case. Yeah. Right, right. And, and the other thing I would say about it is that you have to, when you present this in court, you know, let him rant and rave about your financial condition and your disability and all that. And when it's your turn to talk, you emphasize the parent-child relationship that you have. You emphasize emphasize its warmth, uh, its closeness, 
what kind of conversations you have, what you do for fun, do you help with homework, uh, that kind of thing. You know, a disab in some cases, having a disability is an advantage, right? Because you're yeah. not working outside the home. Right. You have more time to parent. Right. Like a lot of times we have veterans that are, you know, permanently disabled or whatever, and those people have a lot of time for parenting. Right. So they're actually able to be more involved. Right. So that's what I would lean on is I would be positive about my parent-child relationship. And if you don't have a lot to be positive about, then we have lots of episodes on how to build relationships with your kid. Right. And I would listen to those. Right. Okay. So uh, one of our next questions is, what do you do when you have a child that's lying because the other parent is forcing that child to say certain things to like either the mediator or the court or the counselor. So, or so the, this is this is the coached child. Yes, the child is lying because mom. In this case, it's a mom. Mom is coaching the child to you know. Well, the the word that the that they used is forcing the child to say certain things. Right. Well, my uh, my thought, my first reaction to that is bad strategy by the person who's coaching right if the, if our judicial officers or in california some of our counties have recommending counseling uh, so that if anybody gets a whiff of that you're in trouble yeah i mean I, I if i have a case where the other side is coaching a child on what to say to a psychologist or a custody evaluator or to uh, uh, child welfare or anything like that, I'm, I jump all over that. And I say, Your Honor, uh, this child's obviously being coached. She's or using words that are, are inappropriate. Now, I remember one uh, like seven-year-old boy was, was saying things about money that were age inappropriate. Uh, children are not good liars generally. Uh, you know, lying is a skill that you that you learn, and and I find that most of the time when my kids are lying to me, I know it, and yeah. and I'm not a trained professional. <laughs> yeah. But but if you're if the child is lying in the context of uh, of a, an evaluative context, right. like a like a custody evaluation, the, the, then they're doing you a favor. By, right. by coaching them. I think the thing you have to be careful of in this situation is you don't want to let that cause you to become attacking of the other parent and saying, oh, well, she's coaching the child. She's telling the child to say this and she's doing this and she's doing that and she's da 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 You have to present that information in a way that says, well, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that the child, that the, the, the that the that the mother is discussing issues with the child that are inappropriate for her age. Right. You know, I've had the child ask me questions about court hearings, you know, about child support mm -hmm. or about whatever that she shouldn't even be aware are happening. So again, like we say a lot, it's I'm not saying pull your punches and don't bring it out at all but i'm saying you have to be careful in how that's presented because you don't want to present it in an attacking way right. and i find most of the time whether you as the parent that's not doing that um is says anything or not mm -hmm. the professionals will usually figure it out i mean they're they're very especially like an fcs mediator they see this a lot right and i i think you can Talk about the emotions that, that you observe in your children because that's something that, uh, under our rules of evidence, a lay person can give that kind of testimony. Like, uh, it's admissible to say, well, they, so, uh, uh, the defendant looked frightened or the defendant looked angry. You know, we all know what that means. Right. Uh, and, and so when you're talking about the kids, you could say, well, I'm concerned that uh, Johnny feels like he's in a bind or he's being put in the middle. Right. Uh, you know, he's on the one hand, he wants to please his father. Right. And on the other hand, he wants to please me. Right. So I'm concerned that the, 
that when uh, I'm concerned that he's being coached, and when he's coached, that puts too much on him. In, in other words, make the child, the child's welfare the focus of your comment. Yeah, and I think in dealing with the child directly, like if we're not talking about court issues, if we're just talking about like the child's in your home and the child's saying things that you know to be incorrect, you know, I think you have to make a judgment call as to whether you really want to, whether it's something you need to redirect or not. Yeah. You know, because that child's being coached, you have to try to have sympathy for that child and understand they're caught in the middle. Um, so it, it kind of goes back to, you know, our last, last episode of, <laughs> yeah. you know, do you want to be right? You know, and, and, and how important is that compared to the situation you're dealing with? So, I think that, you know, maybe if it's something important, just saying to the child, well, that's not true. What actually happened is blah, blah, blah. And you don't want to say things like, well, your mom's just filling your head with a bunch of, yeah, you know, don't, exactly. don't present it in that way. I like that approach. Yeah. You just say, you know, well, that's not exactly true. Or if it's something that they're coming up with, that's like something about court or something like that, then my standard response to that is something like, um, you know what? There's a lot of adult things going on, but you don't really need to worry about that. We both right. love you, and you just need to, you know. I love that. Be, be happy and be a kid. You know, you know what's awesome about that is that it addresses what the court is really concerned about with these no court orders. What what they're concerned about is they don't want the child to have anxiety right. about adult things. They don't want to have anxiety about the parenting plan or where he's going to live or whether he's going to get to see mom ever right. again. And, you know, to the extent that, that a parent's comments are stoking those fears, right. they're hurting their case. Right. And to the extent that you reassure them, you're helping your case and you're helping your child. Right. Right. Or, you know, it's okay to acknowledge, like, you know, I don't know, maybe – Maybe mom's upset about something, but I'm sure it will be fine. And we, my, again, we both love you. That's always what I put in there. It's like for most children, especially under the age of about, well, just about any age, but really, I think this is primarily up to like 13, 14, somewhere in that age range. I think up to that point, the main thing that child's worried about is do both parents love me and am I going to lose somebody? Yeah. And that's really the underlying thing that they can't recognize themselves that you're trying to reassure in them instead of getting into, well, why did, what did your mother say? Well, how did she, you know, did she tell you this? Well, is she talking to you about this or quizzing them or doing things like that? I mean, you really want to, um, you know, right. And you really want to try to try to stay out of that kind of, Ray of the, of the situation. Yeah, and and get get some coaching around that too. Yeah, that's the that's something. You know, how do you talk to your kids about X, Y, or Z? Is right. is in some ways outside my pay grade as an attorney. Right. This is a lot of yeah. what I talk about in my coaching, you right. know, sessions. Is like how to deal with the other parent. You know how to how to talk to the child. How to you know. Right. How to handle all those situations, but handle them in a way that doesn't hurt you in court. Yeah, and there's a lot of finesse around that. Yes. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's there's do's and don'ts, and but it's really an art rather than a science. Right. Uh, and so having somebody who has that experience in the system to have a conversation and to bounce uh, your responses off of is, is extremely helpful. helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so a second, sort of a secondary question to this is, do parents have the right to record anything, to, to record things that are happening, like with the child or whatever, just to show and have proof for the court? Well, that's an interesting question, because uh, in, in some contexts, surreptitious recording is a crime. Like if you have a contract dispute with somebody, and you surreptitiously turn on a tape recorder and try try to get them to admit that they breached the contract or something like that, right. you can actually be charged with a crime about that. Mm. Uh, but in order to trigger that provision, this is going to sound really technical and legally, but there has to be a reasonable expectation of privacy. 
uh, in the situation. And if the other person knows you're recording and they don't stop talking, then what they say is admissible. I think you have to be careful with this uh, and because surreptitious recording has, uh, I don't know, it, it puts a bad taste in the mouth. But the if you're recording your child, you have the right to record your minor child as a parent. Yes. But the but I would say in practice, I mean, it, legally, do you have the right to do that? Yes. yes. In practice, if it's your child. In practicality, the court isn't going to like it. Right. Yeah, and <laughs> it's I, not a good way to show the court what's going on. That's just not a good way. Right. Yeah. It was, probably, uh, if if you're concerned about some of these things, uh, you you need to suggest that you get the child into therapy, and that's something that we harp on. And not every therapist is all that great, but it, the beauty of of having the child that talk to a therapist is that that therapist is outside of your relationship, your co-parenting relationship. So they have some credibility uh, w when they're speaking. Uh, and uh, also that ultimately is that therapist is a mandated reporter. So if there's abuse, which is really, if, if you're recording your child, then if, if it's not a situation where you're trying to protect their safety or their health, if you're just trying to prove that he's, you know, just a lousy dad or something or mom's coaching her or that he's coat. Yeah. Or that uh, mom's coaching the kid. If I, I'm not sure that that's the best strategy. Right. I mean, I think Thomas yeah. and I would go back to therapy because, because if you're in court, then the court has the ability to talk to that therapist, especially I don't, I don't know the process in other states, but in California, if you have family court services and you're in a recommending county where the, that therapist or that mediator writes a report, that counselor writes a report of a recommendation to the court, those counselors will talk to the therapist right. usually in, in most situations. And so that's a way, and that therapist would be able to say, well, I think this child's being coached and that's going to be way more credible than you saying it right. or you trying to record your child to prove it or any of those things. Right. So, yeah, that's... I agree wholeheartedly with that. Yeah, that's not mm -hmm. something the court would really want to uh, see you do, all things being equal. Um, okay. Let's... Yeah, and, and it's tempting because we have these recorders on our phones. They're ubiquitous now. We didn't use that. I didn't used to see that ever. Right. Like, you know, even 10 years ago, you didn't see it that much, but... Right. Now everybody's got a video. <laughs> yeah. And some of them, frankly, you know, my clients send me these videos and I go, you know, frankly, that's not very persuasive. This this video does not make you look good. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let me find if we need one more. Who is that handsome guy? <laughs> so I'm looking at a computer screen with our website on it. Yeah. And I was saying something self-aggrandizing, which, you know, since I'm a narcissist, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one more. And this might be a whole episode, but um, I, I want you to just give, like, two or three tips on, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um written declarations and how to present your your um, testimony to the court in written form because that's primarily at least in california how it's done is it's it's primarily done in the form of written declarations but if you had to give us your top three tips for verbal presentation in court like i need to present my side to the court in my verbal arguments in court standing in front of the judge just your kind of your general, what would you say are key tips to that? Right. Well, I would say number one, the, the number one thing would be to uh, figure out what the through line of your case is or the or the what I call the theory of the case. That's what they used to call it in law school. Uh, so what's this case really about? Right. Yeah. You know, uh, this case is about uh, the other parents reluctance 
to allow the father enough parenting time. And here are my examples. So you have this through line. It's like a trunk of a tree. And then you hook your facts onto it. You show how those facts lead to the conclusion. Uh, generally, I recommend kind of an outline form. That's what I, when I prepare for hearings, I do an outline. And yeah. is, is that outline based on your written declaration? I mean, are you sort of regurgitating your written declaration or? Well, that depends. And you have to get a feel for that with with your judicial officer. You know, we have judges that, you know, like Pawazic I mentioned in, in another podcast. I've read the declaration. Yeah. Mr. Ferreira. <laughs> Mr. Ferreira, I've read the declarations. Move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then you have. And and this is just and this is not a criticism of the judicial officer, but it's a style. It's a style that says, "I want to hear it from the parties." Yeah. You know, I don't want to just read a declaration. I want to, I want to hear it from the parties so I can evaluate their demeanor. Uh, you know, I think Commissioner Radican was a lot like that. That you she wanted to see the person actually say it and evaluate their demeanor. You know what's interesting yeah. about that comment, and I'm I'm the one that's going to say this because this is yeah. a male female thing, and I know we get in hot water with things like that sometimes. But I find that as a general rule, like Thomas said, every judicial officer is different, and one of the things we talk about is if you have a case coming up, watch your judicial officer, go watch them. You're allowed to attend hearings. That was my second you know. point. Oh, it was. I'm yes. sorry. Yeah. So go <laughs> watch them. So there's tip number two. But uh, in that regard of what you were saying on number one is. Um, I find that the men tend to be readers more often and women tend to want to hear it from the want to hear it from the parties because it's more of like an intuitive right like a gut thing you yeah. know where they like you said they want to see the person's body language their reactions all those things so as a general rule if you're in front of a female you're you may want your speech to be a little more structured around your declaration yeah. If you're in front of a male, you may just want to add yes. a couple points that didn't go into your declaration. Right. So point two was you've you've got this wonderful resource of you, you just look go online and look at the court's calendar and see when your judicial officer is having their next uh, in California we call it a request for order hearing, but you know it can be a motion on temporary order. They have what's called a law in motion calendar. Uh, and the the parties only have a small amount of time to present their cases, even if they have attorneys. Right. So you get to see a variety of cases and engage that court's uh, uh, philosophy and what they think what that judge thinks is important. Right. Uh, and then it's kind of like cheating on a test and almost, you know, yeah. it's like if you want like if you want to do well on a test in college, the key is to attend the lectures right. because what's in the lectures is going to be what what's on the test. Right. And occasionally some yeah. random thing will come out of the book, but that's the one off. Yeah. The vast majority of it comes from the lecture. Exactly. Yeah. So watch go watch the hearings and, and you'll see you'll see people screw up. Right. And you'll see people. You'll see uh, what makes the judge angry. Right. And all those things. Right. And and my final piece of advice is if you're winning, shut up. <laughs> okay. People have such a hard time with this. <laughs> I, I, I've i learned this the hard way. Because I, I, I I'm, I'm loquacious, as I, they say. There's your word of the there's day. There's the word of the day, loquacious. That means talks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think I'm more loquacious than you. But anyway, yeah, it's interesting because I actually got a, a, a question over the weekend um, from somebody uh, who's a listener who, who said, that, said that very thing is the court is like, talking to my ex through the whole thing mm -hmm. and i thought but they see that as a negative and i thought well good that probably means you're winning right you know but people get very because he, here's the here's the uh background behind that what happens is you know they're judges are lawyers so it's sort of like you know, a police officer or, a, you know, anybody along those lines where they're trying to figure out what happened and the person that they don't understand their story or don't find it credible or don't agree with or don't agree with. Yeah. 
that's the person they start asking more questions of because they're trying to figure out what's going on, right? Right. If you tell them something and they understand it and they believe you and it's credible and all that kind of thing, boom, they're not going to have any more questions for right. you. Right. You don't have to rebut everything the other person says. Right. Uh, you, you, know, you, you watch the court, and if the court is asking a lot of questions and trying to clarify them and testing their their theory of the case with questions, then it's best to let the magic just happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Don't get in your own way. I've had the best, <laughs> some of the best results I've had in court were cases where I just, uh, I had a guy, the, the other day I, I was representing a lady mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this guy, he was, rep he, he was represented, right. but his, his attorney was appearing remotely. Right. Uh, she was on video and he it's was harder, basically in the courtroom. It's harder to control. Yeah, it's yeah. harder to control your client when they're in the courtroom and, and you're on video. Right. Uh, and this guy, he complained about her to the court and he turned and he complained about her to the bailiff. <laughs> and I didn't have to say a word. Yeah, he I, dug his own hole. I didn't have to say a single word. <laughs> That's called giving them enough rope right yeah. there to hang themselves. Yeah. That's what that is. Right. All right. So we really appreciate the, ooh, my voice, what did it do right there? We really oh, appreciate it. <laughs> we do. <laughs> uh, that means it's time to wrap up. So we really appreciate the questions and the feedback. Keep them coming. Uh, if you're on the YouTube channel, you know, you have questions about one of the videos or something that you see, uh, feel free to post below those. We try to answer all of the ones that, uh, that we can, that I see, that I, that I possibly can. Um, and also on the uh, podcast, you can also always send us an email at Tammy at divorceuniversityonline.com and um, we'll try to cover future questions as well. So thanks for joining us. If you are watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit like and subscribe so you get notified as new videos come out. And if you're listening to the podcast, please rate and review us and also subscribe so that you get notified of new episodes each week and we'll see you soon. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Divorce University online podcast with your hosts, Thomas and Tammy Ferreira. For more information, visit www.divorceuniversityonline.com.